Hey, what's up, you amazing hackers? Hope you're all doing well today. I'm joined today by the amazing Chironan. Could you please introduce yourself, sir? What up, everybody? It's your boy, the humble hacker from Shottown, Chironan, a.k.a. Roro. How is everyone today? I hope you're doing well. It's good to have you here, my friend. If you guys don't know, Sharonan has an amazing channel as well. I'm going to send you guys towards that. And if you're watching on Sharonan's channel, hello. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> uh, so uh, for those of you guys who don't know yet, Sharonan is also working on a bug bounty guide. Um, and we'll release that soon, I think. Um, if you guys are interested in that, Keep, we'll keep you posted through the channel, through the Twitter. You'll, you'll see your hackers. You'll figure it out. Uh, <laughs> today, what I wanted to do is Mr. Tronen uh, created an amazing presentation on the use of Burp Suite and Zap Proxy. And uh, we called it Proxy Wars. And we wanted to give you guys a little bit of an introduction. So I'm going to hand the floor to Mr. Sharonin here. Dum, dum, dum. He has created a nice presentation for us, and I am drinking from my Peppa Pig cup. And yes, a Peppa Pig cup, because I have a little girl, and I have no cups that are clean. I really need to put on the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> it, I cannot share my screen. Oh, yeah, because, of course. I'm cause an the, idiot. Because the, the host said, go off. So I have to ask the host for actual permission you yeah can... that host can be an asshole sometimes there we go <laughs> that should be better <gasps> real wowzers Thank it's you, like sir. hacks right like amazing hacks suddenly happening freaking wow yes okay so ladies and gentlemen welcome to the proxy wars. <gasps> Sorry. Sounds all <laughs> kinds <right>. of hellable. <laughs> all kinds of horrible. Uh, it's been Halloween. So, we need some excitement in our lives. Oh, yes. And <laughs> and some candy as well. Sharks. Uh, a, a proxy, by definition, acts like an intermediary between an end user and a the server they are communicating with. So the end user can, can view or edit that communication that the uh, server responds to a user with. Uh, these communications are what happens behind the scenes when navigating a web application. Now, all of that, how can we simplify this? Shikata Ganai. Uh, think of it as, um, as the, the application has like security measures and requirements to help you like to determine if you can or cannot access a certain area. It's like being screened at a nightclub or through TSA, right? Where you can't get in unless you pass their security check. So the application, like, so we go over to the application and we want to see what we can do. And the thing says, hey, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Uh, who the hell is you? Right? And they do the, and they do like the pat down and play with your hidden areas, your, your 403s, stuff like that to see like what you got packing and whatnot, right? Another example is like being in a museum where we can see the artifacts that's enclosed in glass and the paintings that are on the walls and stuff like that. But from a security perspective, we want to know things like what type of glass is surrounding these pieces? Uh, are these do, are these glass connected to any type of security system? Are the paintings attached to any type of security system? Like, uh, and how can we, if you want to get in and make a closer look, how can we get in safely? and bypass these security controls without setting off any alarms or whatever. Um, so if I'm right, it's basically these security things, these security measures, you basically put yourself between the outside world and the object, and you want to see what is the outside world doing to interact with this object through the security measures. And you're also going to see what is this object sending back to the outside world and through what measures right right so yeah. that's proxy nice nice okay cool thank mm -hmm. so this is basically a good example of how a proxy works that i could think of so we got like a browser right that has whatever it is we can visually see that right in front of our faces just like we can see 
this violation, this this 403 error, forbidden error, like right in front of our faces, right? This is from the browser and uh, perspective and what our, what we can what we can see with our eyes behind the scene actually is the x-ray seeing what's through the clothing trying to identify what objects are are these able to be passed through or not for, from a browser's perspective th this is what it goes on behind the scenes which is our like our request what type of request is it what status code did it give is there like an error um the uh, like data of what server's running and things of that uh and things of that nature sorry my throat got super dry <laughs> and this is why we use proxies i need to get my water so that's awesome gonna, that's really awesome gonna be looking at two uh the uh burp suite i was gonna say browser again like my moron but <laughs> okay. we have two major proxies that we can use burp suite either community or professional and OWASP zap which is open source and both of them basically are the same uh however with uh zap we would just have one additional um like tool that we would have to use so a lot of the stuff from burp suite easily translates <laughs> into OWASP Zap. So instead of the site map, we have the site tree. Uh, the repeater uh, is replaced by the request editor, a burp intruder. Uh, for burp, we use the fuzzer and zap. Spider's the exact same. Um, and the interceptor and break, uh, those are pretty important because those are basically what the, the what the, what is that damn word in burp? The, uh, when we turn, we turn. Sorry, when we turn intercept on, we can simply turn on break and zap, and just the difference of like scope and context. So, so that's basically when like I put a request through my browser and I have break on or I have intercept on, it stops that request and I can edit it right at that moment, right? Correct. Yeah, that's and awesome. Zap also has like a like a request editor already like, um, on from its so from its toolbar. So if we find a request that we want to play with, we can just simply go to that um, as well with any of the requests and alter it if we want. Uh, there's only one small difference between the two. This is just from a beginner's perspective is Burt Collaborator. Now, this is by my understanding because I have the professional version, so I haven't checked the community yet, that this is a uh, tool that's only accessible in the professional version. So this, uh, test entry points of an application that checks for like out of band communication. This is helpful for testing for like open redirects and like SSRF or chaining an SSRF with the XXE. So this tool in essence, it basically creates like a miniature server that we're trying to see if we can get a response back from, from an application. And if we do get a response, then we have potentially the um, SSRF to look for there. Unfortunately, no. this is not in Zap, but we can simply MacGyver that shite. And we have one dope alternative that I, uh, we have two alternatives, but one of them I really like. Um, we have the Interact SH client. Uh, this is ran through the, uh, the CLI. So basically it's uh, going over to doing like the typical go to the GitHub repo and some, um, drop it over into your um over to like your os uh, command line you can run this interact ch from there or this interact sh or there's a uh, webhook dot site this is it's exactly like uh burp collaborator really um running the exact same way where we take the address that uh, this tool gives us put it over into a potentially vulnerable parameter and if we do get an H, if we do to get a response back, we get a response from uh, from as we see from this screen here. This is pretty much the same thing that we would get in Burp Collaborator, only we could use this for free. Now, if it's okay with you, Brian, I'm quickly going to reclaim host and I'm going to show you guys this, what all of this means practically. And then Brian's going to take you guys through all of the other features. Now, why am I doing this like this? Because I forget. I forget what I have to show <laughs> otherwise. So sorry for interrupting you, my friend. That's um, all good. 
One thing that you'll immediately notice when you start up Burp and Zap is that a Zap works different. Zap doesn't save a file. Zap is basically an application that starts up with a database in the backend and it saves its session data in the database, not in a single file. That is why Zap is asking for persistence persistence in a specific database and you can choose to persist or not persist the session but if you're pen testing always persist that shit and make sure that you put it in your report as well as an extra attachment all of those things are going to be super useful to recreate your attacks and stuff like that in burp suite we have projects that we can put on disk and we can start a new project those are the things now if you have burp suite free you cannot save your project that's a major pain in the A. That is a major pain in the A. Believe me, saving your projects is one of the biggest gripes that I have with Burp Suite Free. It's really annoying because if you only have like an hour to hack, you don't want to start up 15 minutes setting up your parameters properly every single time. You just want to open your project and go. Again, Burp Suite. Whoa, <laughs> I'm throwing stuff around here. Burp Suite, make sure that you save your file and enter it in your report as an attachment. Those things are very important. Now, what, we say, what we've seen before is that Zap works on contexts, whereas Burp Suite will work on the proxy, uh, sorry, the target tab and then scope. So here you can set up a specific scope, which I'll do right now, expert.com, for example. And I'm going to run on that specific part. Now, I don't know if you're going to come to this. I think we are, but I, like I say, I forget stuff. So I'm just going to show it right now. Zap has different modes as well. I started in safe mode. Safe mode means that it doesn't attack anything. It's just passive there. You're going to be the attacker. And I'm going to do a manual exploration of my URL that I'm attacking. So in this case, it's going to be HTTPS expert.com and I'm just going to open that manually with Firefox. Now I usually try to have the HUD up as well and that's something that I love about OWASP Zap is that HUD. Now what will that do on the sides of your windows? It will start up a heads up display where you can add specific features. For example, I can immediately start an active scan from here. But the very first thing I'm going to do is go to hexpert.com and include that in my context, either a new one or a default one. And here you can see that it adds it to that context in the inclusions. If you're setting up a zap, Set up your context from top to bottom. Do this every single time. So you go over your includes, your excludes, and here, why is this a little bit more confusing in Burp Suite, in my opinion? Because it's not a beautiful list. In Burp Suite, you set your scope in scope, out of scope. Now, in Zap, I'm going to go to my structure next. That's a different setting somewhere hidden in Burp Suite. Technology, same thing. Am I going to scan for all of these technologies? Yes or no? Those are all settings hidden away. Authentication, users, set that up properly. We'll get to authentication later. But first things first, I have my item in scope. Now I can do an active scan if I want to. But as you can see, if it's in safe mode, it's not going to do that. So now I can put it in standard mode because I have a scope and I can perform an active scan. When I do an active scan, I have different scan policies here in Burp Suite. If I do that in, uh, in Zap, I'm going to mix up Zap and Burp Suite a thousand times. If I do an active scan here in Burp Suite, you can see that I also have a scan configuration, but it's a little bit different. Now this, Policy is going to determine how deep it's going to scan, what it's going to scan for, etc. If I want to overwrite that at runtime, I can click show advanced options where I have different filters, different input attack vectors. And this is an important one. If you want to scan deep, you need to scan 
all of these input attack vectors. Of course, you need to test for cookie data as well. What if they have a specific cookie and they handle it in a non-secure way? All of these things need to be scanned. And I'm not talking about just the flag missing. I'm talking about taking data from that cookie and throwing it into the application without sanitization. Those things need to be checked. Custom vectors, technology, and here we come to the policy. How deep do we want to scan and when do we want to sound an alarm? Do we want to scan insanely deep for all of these things or do we just want to scan medium? That will depend on what your client is asking. If their client is asking for a very deep scan, you have to scan to the insane level, of course. Now I'm going to start my scan and as you'll see, it will first start crawling the entire website, grabbing all of the URLs and then it'll scan. So it's basically a crawl and an audit as we can see here, crawl and audit, very similar thing. We were talking about other things as well, such as the break here. As you can see, we also have a break. Now my little bar is in the way here but we have a HTTP breakpoint at which the same thing will happen as when we go to the proxy and we put intercept to on. So as you can see, it's very similar. We have an HTTP history here. We have the sites here. We have a WebSocket history here. I don't know if Zap can handle WebSockets, but WebSocket is one of the big things that is coming up. So very important. Our interceptor, that is our request response editor here. Sorry, I mean our repeater, of course. That is our request response editor. If we take a specific request, we can see the request that has been made, the response that has been made, and we can always right click it where we can do several things. Open slash resend with request editor. Here we can edit our requests and do some other things with it that we want. Remember, you can easily switch method if you click right here. You don't have to change it all yourself. Just a little tip that I can give you. Also the response, of course. Now, when we're scanning, as you can see, it might take a little bit for all the crawling to continue. Burp Suite has the same thing. Crawling might take a little bit. Collaborator, that is the thing that our dear friend Brian was talking about. Collaborator is also something like webhook.site, for example. What this is, is an out-of-band server. That is what we call it. And we get a specific URL here. And we can also go to our labs, for example, where we have a, a, where we have a um, request that can go out. So... Let's quickly look at this page. We can inspect the page source. Here we can see a request. So question mark URL equals, let's try that. Question mark URL equals, and then add our webhook.site URL there. Do we get a request? No, something must be wrong with the server. That happens, the lab might be down, might be broken. If I enter that request directly, which is what a server would do, then I can see a request coming in. So this is the request that Brian was talking about. As you can see, a whole lot of stuff, but I'm going to give the word back to Brian. Blah, Brian, Jesus, my bad. I know a Brandon and I know a Brian and I know Burp Suite and I know Zap and I always confuse all of that stuff. So please forgive me for confusing that stuff. I'm going to make you host again and I'm going to give you back the opportunity to share the screen while I drink from my Peppa Pig cup and cheers to you all. Well, I see. I really didn't have that much like additional to to add i do have um both my my burp and zap up here to for like explain uh the differences of using these two uh to try to get something uh like from them and whatnot um so we are so everybody we already know about um like our issues window and our history window actually i screwed the scope up on this thing a little bit but i can go ahead and fix that no problem but 
here's essentially where we would see like all of our like requests and and this this part i in all honesty i say don't even like trip on this section here because it really doesn't do much of jack <laughs> really in zap we basically have like the same thing we have like our responses that we get from spidering a page you see i'm working on like hexpert right here i can view the request get to view the response i can create a request if i want to uh, if i find one and i want to tinker with it um here where we got i can simply take this right clicking that request going over to open the send a request editor this is basically the equivalent of the repeater and just and just tinker with it see what all i can screw around with and whatnot uh gotta actually let me let me take one of them and just just play around with it uh, let me see uh Here we are. Which one was that for? There we are. So I can tinker. Uh, yeah, it's, so I can pretty much like tinker with this if I want. Uh, go going back to the editor, sending this request. I can see where response. Let me go back. I can try to do directory traversal if this is even possible. Then one thing that I. Like one thing that I see on your screen as well, and that I keep forgetting to tell everybody, Zap is context dependent. You really need to realize what that means. If you open Zap, you see the windows that Zap thinks are important to you. If you want other windows, you have to click that green plus button in the tabs. Uh, if you'd like, for example, want a new tool to run and you want to start up that tool directly, in the bottom bar, you have the tabs like history, search, alert, output, but you can also click that plus and you can start a new tab directly with, for example, a port scan or some other things. And all of these things are ex uh, available in the store as well, like the auth matrix. I love the auth matrix. It, I think it's called authorize or authorization or something in, in um, burps, no, sorry, in Zap. And in Burp Tweet, it's called Off Matrix. This is some really cool tools, like all of these extensions that are being made. And if you feel like you can contribute, even with just a translation, those things are always needed and welcome. Like this is an open source project. Burp Suite is made by people who get paid $400 per year per license for a professional license. Zap is made by people who want to do this in their free time. It's different, totally different. So if you feel like you can contribute, I think people would love it if you would contribute. So that, that's just what I wanted to say. Sorry about interrupting you, my friend. Oh, no. No, that's all good. I mean, I only had like one other thing just to point out, which is like just the dopeness of the fuzzer on this joint. Because um, this, to me, be, if you don't have the professional version of Burp, then Zap basically replaces that no problem with this fuzz option right here. Um, to see where I like highlighted John, I just go over to fuzz. I confirm what place that I want to fuzz, which is this here. It already has it added. And even if I didn't have it added, I can just go over to request, go over to fuzz and then select what I want. So I selected that part and I can, and I, here's where I add my payloads. And then this gives us like two options. Either we can, um select a file like our own like type of a file or whatever um that we want to use for our payloads or it has them like already here from like from J Fuzz, Fuzz TV, Durbuster, Wireless, and whatnot that we see listed here. So we can just simply like pick one of these. And these are also found over in um that that sec lists thing too. That's on like GitHub and everything. And we can just simply use this to basically do do the same thing that we can find in in burp pro uh, that we don't get in burp community so that's the, this is the other reason why i definitely like like the fuzzer uh in zap and use that and use that a lot too yeah and like burp suite you have it as well but it's slow as as a snail it's literally slow as a snail like they limit the throughput that you can get with the free version of burp suite through like one per second or something one request per second yeah it's really slow like unbearably slow even 
and like like Brian says as well, you have all of these lists built in. How amazing is that? And I know that these aren't the be all end all lists. You know, it's better to create your own word list per target. But sometimes you just need a quick word list to go, and hip, you got it there for free. All of these tools are in Zap for free, so just give it a shot. You know, it never hurts. I know it's a little bit of adaptation. But everything that Burp Suite has, Zap has as well. Brian looks at it from a bug bounty perspective. So you have the perspective of, uh, yeah, that automated scanning isn't really going to be useful. I look at it as a pen tester. For me, it's super, super useful at automated scanning because I, I can give my, like, even if there's a vulnerable JS version that I'm not able to exploit, I need to report that to my target because they might not have exploitability today, but there might be a change tomorrow which enables exploitability of that vulnerability. So that's a big, that's like a big difference. If you're a bug bounty hunter, that fuzzer is going to be really useful because as you guys know, content fuzzing is content fuzzing, meaning you can fuzz for files, for directories, for subdomains. Why is nobody DNS brute forcing for subdomains? Everybody is doing DNS enumeration for subdomains. Why not brute force that? Ha oh, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> it's so strange. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sometimes I can get a little bit like excited about this stuff. And like, guys, guys, gals, rats, whoever's watching, if you're getting into bug bounties, stop with the broad scope bullshit. Like, I don't want to offend anybody. These methodologies are amazing, but what are you going to do when you find your target? You are going to do broad scope. You're going to do enumeration of all of these subdomains. You're going to pick one, and then what? How are you going to hack it if you don't know how to hack a single target? Like That's the whole point of broad scope, is you want to do both automated scanning to get as much results as possible. But believe me, everybody knows how to use MS. Like it's, it's a tool that you download, you run it, a mass enum, and then you enter the domain, done. Like my grandmother knows how to do that if I give her like an hour of explanation. Believe me, my grandmother is an amazing hacker. You don't want to fuck with her. <laughs> Sorry, just, just joke, but like I think Brian can attest to this. Like it's really hard when you do broad scope to actually pick a target and to find vulnerability on it. Like, just if you do broad scope, just pick a target and stick with it for like eight hours. That might be, sound insane, eight hours, but the average pen test that we do is like a month long, like for a small target. That should give you a little bit of perspective, you know? Like if we have bug bounties with like big targets, do DNS brute forcing if you must do that kind of stuff. Make sure that you write your own nucleate template and that you don't just rely on community written templates. Uh, make sure that you go out of your way because if you do the same steps that everybody else is doing, you're going to get the same results as everybody else is getting and you're either going to get a duplicate or nothing. So that's just how I look at it. I don't know if you have any more tips for like beginner or bug bounty hunters, Brian. Um, uh, I, I second that um the give uh from a beginner's perspective if i can utilize my um uniqueness to describe it is when it comes to broad scopes uh coming from me who has like anxiety and a little bit of adhd um when it comes to broad scopes uh take four of these and call somebody else because I don't want nothing to do with them. I, they really freak me out. Uh, like, cause I, I have, I am getting out of that mindset of, you know, like do, do broad scopes. Cause not that many people are going to touch them and stuff. But then I, I do the deep diving into the subdomain enumeration. And then I go, what do I do now? And it, cause it's like, cause I don't know what to pick. I don't know where to start. And I get mad at myself and I pick another target and I go and I go like there. Um, so what I've done, um, I've done it on some of my live streams. Like hopefully if I get like the um, like the, the amount of like, followers, uh, 
and people who view it, I'll, I'll get back into live streaming, but I created checklists via the, um, the web application hackers handbook version two. So I would basically summarized the important parts of them chapters down to a checklist uh, that I would follow. I have one specifically for recon one specifically for the, app, for the, for the web app. Then on top of that, to kind of keep track of everything, I built out uh, an X mind template that's that wrong. starts with like all of the um all the Shikata Ganai that I need, right? With like where I got like my like got my my recon, I got my um like when I discover like the, the endpoints and like my proxy or whatever, I take all those endpoints, I like I put them in their section, I put what's in robot.txt, I put in like the recon stuff of like the technology where I use MAP, Nikto, uh what web, WAF, Wolf. And I put my my vulner, my my bug skill set and stuff like that. So like so, and I have it all based on that one subdomain. So I so I have it like so I got all of my info in two places, either my checklist or in my X mind, and I just and I just like follow that. Yeah, that's that's a great tip. Like flowcharts are super important, like even more important than checklists, in my opinion. Like just a basic flowchart. If you say, okay, I have a domain, first thing I do, I go look for subdomains. Whatever tool I use, that doesn't really matter. Like I can use a million tools as long as I use them all and see which one fits best. And I just keep using them all. Like don't stick to one tool forever. There is a there's a great tool for job X and there's another great tool for job Y and those jobs may seem similar, but they have a slight variation in them, which makes different tools better for different jobs. So just try everything. And then when you have your subdomains, you're gonna do a port scan. You're going to find all the web servers. You're gonna run Nuclear, you're gonna run Nikto. Uh, you're going to do all of the other things that you've learned in the OSCP. Like you're, if you have port uh, FTP open, you're going to do your FTP attacks. But nine times out of 10, especially in bug bounties, a lot of Googling is going to be involved anyway. Like yeah. if this bugs were straightforward, they would have been found already. But the beautiful thing about bug bounties is that you can go wild and you don't have to stick to a script. Like if you... One, if you're bored, if you're on the toilet taking a dump, print out the CWE list with all of its explanations, everything, the full CWE list. And there's some bullshit in there, believe me, but there's also some great stuff in there that should give you some inspiration. And the last thing I would like to say is go for broken access control, but you have to go with the right target, always always, always spend a lot of time picking your target because you're going to spend a lot of time together and it's going to be like picking out your future wife. You don't want to have an argument with your future wife. You don't want to have an argument with your future bug, bug bounty program. So make sure that you pick something that fits you, fits you well, and don't go for newspapers. Don't go for web shops. Those have low um features you're not going to be able to hack a lot on them don't go for um, bug bounties that pay out 10k per bounty because those are going to be very hardened people don't just throw out 10k believe me if you want that you're gonna have to fight for it um go for something like a vulnerability disclosure program with a lot of access levels that you can have user accounts on those access levels because that will easily allow you to do broken access control. Something like an HR application, something like a CRM, um, all of those types of things with different access levels are going to be super great as a starter target, in my opinion. But that's just how I work. Like if you go to Jason Haddix, the guy is a freaking pro at broad scope. So he'll give you a different methodology. And Brian is a pro at other things. We all have our different methodologies. What you need to do as a viewer is you need to listen to all those methodologies, pick the parts that you like and puzzle together your own. That's the best thing you can do in my opinion. Yep, totally. And that's what I, that, and that's what I do. I, 
I, I mine's like the Bruce Lee method. I take what's useful, discard what's not, and that's what that's how I was able to build out like my lists and my X mind, um, like template and stuff. I love that you say that because Bruce Lee doesn't just practice a kick once; he practices a kick a million times over. And that's something that we as hackers have to do as well. Repeat, 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 repeat. If you do a million port scans, you start finding random stuff. Like for example, Nmap has a flag for randomly selecting a number of hosts. How crazy is that? If you, if you, for example, want to scan the entire internet for web servers, you just put on a scan for port 80 and 443 on the entire internet subnet mask, and you just say, um, pick me 50 random targets. Nmap has that possibility. Like, how crazy is that? Pick me 50 random web servers. And there's a lot of other things that, that these tools can do, and that's just Nmap. So uh, that's what I would like to end on. I don't know if you have any more tips for our viewers, Brian? Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't have any uh, tips, uh, really. I mean... Okay. Um, just to check, just like to check the channel out, like uh, my channel out. Let me know if like you guys think, you know, just liking and like sharing and subscribing, building like the channel up and stuff like that. So we can we can keep pumping out more dope content and whatever. You know, there's a lot of there's there's some stuff that I'm planning on um, making more modules about and everything. I, I'm gonna try to make a video this weekend to stay on my one week schedule, but it was like stuff was just too. Bleh this week but yeah i'm gonna definitely get back on get back on like my track i got i'm trying to perfect my method as far as my movie reviews go on my movie review channel and stuff i might just do watch parties instead but you need people to like to to attend to those and stuff but that's basically all that i got i'm going to definitely put your uh, channel in the description below so if anybody's watching this on my channel, I'm going to put every social link in the description below. Feel free to check it out. Ronan has a really funny style of, of, of bringing content and everybody seems to appreciate that humor. Um, he's also in the ethical hacking guide and everybody loves you there. So I oh, really appreciate it. <laughs> it's awesome having you on the channel, man. And good talking to you as always. I really appreciate you as a friend. Man, it's always great talking to you, man. Thanks a lot, man. I really hanging, appreciate it. Always great hanging out with friends, bro. Yeah, for sure. And always great bringing some content for the viewers as well while we do it. I love discussing these kinds of things and then working together with you is like a dream. So thanks a lot, man. <laughs> I'm going to give you a virtual high five. <laughs> All right. I'll do one of them too. <laughs> all right thank you very much my dear audience and thanks brian's audience as well i will see you guys later bye bye my friends bye